for uh, the purpose of the recording. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm glad to see some familiar faces and uh, some that I don't know. I'm Liesl Gambold and I teach in the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology and um, I organized this evening uh, because I did this last year for the first time and um, I felt like it went well and the feedback that I got was good. Um, and last year we didn't pack the house <laughs> either, but, uh, but I had conversations with people afterwards that uh, were really meaningful to me, so I thought, well, I'll do it again. So why organize something called fail whatever, you know, at a university? Come here, people talk about failure. Um, and I think that for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that I felt like a lot of my students were um, were very afraid of failing, uh, and you know, not necessarily like failing out of university, but doing poorly on an assignment or failing an exam. Which I understand, one tries to avoid that, but I would talk to them and say, "It's okay." Oh no, but you know, I'm not that kind of student, or. Um, or the anxiety would just build right in front of me and I'd say, no, really, it's, it's okay. Let's just move on, you know, what are you gonna do now? So I thought, this is so interesting because I didn't have so much anxiety about failing um, when I was an undergrad and I don't know why uh, because I, you know, did not get A's on everything or B's or C's. Um, <laughs> So, and you know, I lived to, uh, to go on and um, finish my PhD and have a great job teaching. So that's what really inspired me as I thought, you know, I stand in front of uh, students all week and um, do the best I can to deliver lectures and try to keep them awake and, and even interested. And I imagine that they think that, you know, I was this awesome student, I went into university, I said, oh, I'm gonna major in anthropology, and then I'm gonna go to grad school and get a PhD, and now I'm a professor, and you know, all the pieces of the puzzle just kind of went together on my little yellow brick road, which is absolutely not true. Um, and so I thought, you know, that it would be good just to allow students to hear a little bit about the paths of people like varsity coaches and professors who are in these, these positions that you think, wow, you know, um, they uh, have never experienced the kind of struggle I'm experiencing. They've never failed, because look where they are. Um, so that was sort of the inspiration behind organizing this. Um, so with that said, this evening's quite informal, and uh, we're just going to go through the speakers as listed. Uh, we'll all speak, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions and comments, which I, I really Welcome. Last year there were some comments and thoughts that, uh, that really surprised me and uh, I thought really added to the evening, so feel free. Okay. So our first speaker is Carrie Dawson and she's an associate professor in the English department. Um, so Carrie, do you want to, you maybe don't have to hold this so awkwardly, but you can clip it or but I do have to hold it? Um, yeah, it has to be just, Spencer will give you the thumbs up or the, and this. Is that okay, Spencer? Perfect. Okay. You can put it on the table, you can put it here, wherever you want. I think I'm good here. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay. First of all, um, I'm grateful to be here with you on unceded Mi'kmaq territory. So having said that though, I'm not actually sure what I'm doing here. Um, when Liesl told me, I was uh, suggested to me that I might be a natural choice for a panel on failure, 
I was a bit taken aback, um, but I was also really pleased to accept. But then I spent the next two weeks reviewing all of my personal and professional failings and trying to decide which would be the most fitting or instructive to share with you guys. And things got dark fast. <laughs> um, but what I decided is that I don't feel right talking about a past failure that I recovered from and learned from because I am very much a work in progress. Uh, so what I have for you is not a dramatic story of a single spectacular failure. Instead, I've got two really brief stories about my very ongoing attempt to recognize a set of behaviors that continue to hold me back in aspects of my life. These are stories that reflect on my ongoing fear of vulnerability and the difficulty I have in asking people for help. The word stories is important here because what I hope to come round to is the idea that I think the stories that we tell ourselves and the stories we tell about ourselves can shape our actions. So as recently as three days ago, four days ago, I had no idea what I was going to say to you tonight. And then I got into kind of an argument with one of my best friends. And it unsettled me a bit. She's a doctor, the, the real kind of doctor. And knowing that I've been recovering from a concussion, and I've had bad headaches, she asked after my health. And I gather that I was kind of dismissive, that I brushed her off because she told me that I did that. <laughs> And then she told me very clearly that I was the worst patient she'd ever come across because I treated illness like it was a personal failing and that I clearly hated needing help and that that made me mean. And she was right. And I knew it, but there was no way I was going to admit it. So I took this deep breath and I started to say something and she held up her hand and she said, I know you're going to start talking about Cheerios. Cheerios, the cereal. But the thing is, I was. I was about, going to, about to start my Cheerios story. So it gave me pause. So tonight what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to talk about Cheerios. I'm going to tell you the very short story of why I hate Cheerios. And then I'm going to tell you why I'm going to stop telling that story after tonight. So growing up, I had an older brother, Russell. He was 12 months older than me, and from birth he was really handicapped. Um, when he was about a year old, my parents were told that he would probably never walk. Russell and I were born in the late 60s. And it was kind of a, a groovy time, right? Um, so at that time, there were some medical professionals who believed in what they called patterning. They believed that if you moved someone's limbs back and forth, in the pattern of walking for eight to 10 hours a day that the brain might memorize that action and that thus somebody could learn to walk. So of course my parents tried it. With help from their friends, they, um, they spent the better part of a year moving Russell's limbs back and forth in the pattern of walking for, as I say, about eight to 10 hours a day. So this meant they needed me to be quiet so my mom told me that for months, she would every day put me in a playpen beside Russell's crib, and whenever I made noise, she would lean over and sprinkle Cheerios on me. Now, it worked. I was quiet. I don't remember it, but she told me that it worked. She told me that story when I was in my late 20s, and I remember being really struck by it. I remember feeling like it explained a lot. It explained why I was quite a fat kid. <laughs> it explained maybe why I hate Cheerios. But I remember thinking that it explained something about why it feels important to me to be self-sufficient. Maybe why it's hard for me sometimes to ask for help. So over the years, I think I've used that story to explain myself to myself and my friend Mandy would say that I've used it to explain myself to others. But this week when I was talking to my friend Mandy, I realized that I've used that story 
to justify patterns of behavior that don't serve me very well. I think I liked telling friends or myself that story because it draws attention to my vulnerability, my sad little inner Cheerios kid, right? But it also justifies my unwillingness to be vulnerable as an adult, to ask for help today. So I feel like I need to start telling different stories. So here's one that I tell a lot less often. When Russell died, I was living in Australia. I was about 27 or 28. I was working on my PhD, and I flew home to Vancouver. And as you can imagine, it was a terrible time. It was also a really lonely time, and it was made lonelier by the fact that I hadn't been living in Vancouver for a couple of years. Um, so I hadn't been with Russell in the years leading up to his death. But what matters for our conversation tonight is that I found myself utterly unable to talk to the people closest to me about what I was feeling, or even about what they were feeling, about their grief. So maybe it was because I was the Cheerios kid, right? Maybe it was because I had learned from a young age to be self-sufficient, to not make emotional demands on other people. Or maybe it was just because grief was huge and new and scary, because I'm somebody who likes to be prepared for things, likes to be in control, and you can't be prepared for grief, and you can't meet grief with control. So I knew I needed to talk to somebody, um, so I took about 500 bucks against my student loan, and I booked a couple of appointments with a therapist. Went to the first ap uh, appointment with her and explained, I'm here because I need to talk about grief. I need to talk about my brother's death. So I started talking. And eventually she held up her hand and she said, you don't need any help talking. She said, you actually need to stop talking. She said, you need to stop intellectualizing your feelings. You need to actually just let yourself feel them. Let yourself be angry. Let yourself be vulnerable. Let go of your self-control. And man, she was so right. She was so right that I left and I never went back. I took the remaining 350 bucks and I bought a really nice leather jacket. <laughs> I still have that jacket. I call it my therapy jacket. Recently I've started wearing it again. So I wear this jacket because I like the fact that it's this thing that shields me from the world, but it's also this thing that now I use to remind me to be more open to the world. It reminds me that self-sufficiency and self-control, they can be virtues, but they can also lead to isolation. It reminds me that change requires risk, but that risk almost always involves vulnerability. And it reminds me that accepting help when I need it isn't just wise, but in some ways it's also generous because being more open and more emotionally available to the people I care about is a form of generosity. And it reminds me of my brother. So by way of conclusion, has anyone he heard of Tom King, the um, Canadian and Cherokee writer? So Tom King um, says the truth about stories is that that's all we are. I think his point is that we're shaped by the stories that we tell, including the stories we tell to ourselves or about ourselves. So I guess my contribution tonight has been an attempt to share with you the process by which I'm learning to let go of a certain set of stories about self-control and self-sufficiency and Cheerios, um, and instead trying to listen and learn from and find myself in a different set of stories that might teach me to be brave enough to be vulnerable and strong enough 
to ask for help more often. Thanks. Okay, next uh, we have Eli Diamond. Um, he is an associate professor in the Department of Classics. And maybe he has a Shreddy's story. Yes. All right, is that all right there? Great. Oh, that was such a nicely, nicely told narrative. <laughs> this is maybe going to be a little bit more uh, random and s stream of consciousness, but um, I did feel like I was well chosen to be an authority on failure. I had quite a lot of uh, material to work with, and what I mainly had to do was to separate my failing backwards <laughs> from my failing forwards, from my sort of failing on the spot. Um, and my, the times I failed, and the times I am failing, and the times I will fail. But I'll try to cover a little bit of all of that. I, I certainly, I was one of those students who uh, uh, kind of made it into university by the skin of my teeth. Uh, I spent high school getting uh, suspended a couple of times and um, in a sort of, not a very serious moment, but seemed kind of serious at the time, got arrested once. Um, and uh, my father, many years later, told me, uh, I still loved you, but I had certainly uh, written you off in terms of making anything of yourself. But I, any, in, I somehow ended up at this fine institution <laughs> as an undergraduate, so I'm very grateful to Dalhousie for, uh, um, for that. But I, I did discover a kind of focus when I came as an undergraduate because I started discovering some things that I found genuinely interesting, which was part of the problem, <laughs> I think, uh, before, before I came here. Um, and uh, uh, I, I was very clear right from my first year that I was going to become a school teacher. And uh, so I decided in my third year, I would start trying to get some teaching experience. And I got, uh, I got a job teaching French every noon hour at La Marchand uh, Public School, um, teaching grade primary. And they were totally adorable. And I was pretty convinced I would be really good at this. And I was really bad <laughs> at it. I could not control five-year-old children at all, at all, at all. Uh, and I've got a few students here who have been in my classes, and they know that one of my strengths as a teacher is not really crowd control. Uh, so this, this is what I discovered to the point that actually the parents started complaining to the school uh, uh, partly that their kids weren't learning any French, which was surely true, but also I um, decided to make sock puppets with them one day, and I just used some of my old socks. And they thought that that was, I mean, I cleaned them. They were washed, but they, uh, the parents found that disgusting, which is, I suppose, understandable. But anyhow, it was very clear to me after this year uh, that I was not meant to be a primary teacher. Uh, and um, one of my profs actually um, told me, actually, I won't write you letters for teachers college. Um, you should try to do an MA uh, here. And so I, so I, did, I did that. And that all um, has worked out uh, pretty well. But I did want to mention one particularly dark period of my graduate school life. And it, it actually came out of too many good things happening at once. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't quite catch up with it. That is, I was trying to finish my doctoral dissertation. And um, uh, I had a, my first child. 
And I got a job in Fredericton, uh, uh, but we were completely broke, <laughs> and I needed to finish my dissertation if I was going to take up this job. Uh, so we moved back in with my parents-in-law in rural Nova Scotia in a little fishing village called Harborville for the summer, and someone actually donated their home to me to go work at so I could finish this thing because everything was depending on it. And I couldn't, I, the most ridiculous writer's block imaginable because I had written my thesis doing all the parts that were clear to me and saving all the parts that were hard for the end, and they were really hard. And so day in and day out, I would walk down this dirt road <laughs> with these bags of books uh, on the Bay of Fundy shore and go to this house and spend days and days working and not getting anywhere. And the clock was uh, ticking. Um, and I mean, what I always tell students is writer's block is real, and I don't know anybody who hasn't encountered writer's block. And all you can really uh, do is keep, uh, keep at it, and the struggle and the empty pages, uh, there are things going on there, and that, uh, I mean, I did, I did make it out of there, and I did make it, make it uh, through. Um, I did want to sort of conclude, because I really di didn't want to give you the impression, like Carrie, that these are all failures that once I became a prophet Dell. I checked uh, at, the, at the door. Something about the academic uh, life is uh, there's a lot of criticism and rejection, actually, that you're constantly encountering in the form of, you know, you submit things and they come back with the harshest criticism, way harsher than I would ever put on any of your uh, of your papers, or then you put things out there and you get your books reviewed, and some of them are fine, and some of them, you know, I wrote a book on Aristotle and a very prominent review on the main philosophy website said about this book of Aristotle, I'm not sure we need a book on Aristotle by a raving Platonist. That maybe doesn't mean anything to you, but I don't think it was really meant as a compliment, although I <laughs> usually do take that kind of thing as a compliment. Um, uh, and one thing <clears throat> that I think is uh, important that I've learned through this is I will get, you, you have one prof in your class, and so often you'll get feedback, and it's just the opinions of that prof. When you submit something to a journal or to a publisher, often you get three or four reports. And here's where you see that you can't define yourself by your feedback because sometimes on the very same point, they'll say, this was the best part of the thing, this was really great. And the other person's saying, this is the most incoherent part of the thing, getting opposite views of the very same um, points, and uh, which has helped me not be so defined by the brutal <laughs> criticism that you're constantly receiving as a student. Uh, I would say the main respect in which I continue to be a uh, failure, and it's the grand hypocrisy of my life, but I think generally of academia, is I spend a good part, about half of my life enforcing deadlines <laughs> on students and reprimanding them for their you know, lack of organization and so on for not meeting them, and about the other half of my life constantly missing all the deadlines <laughs> for my own work. And it's because I've got a lot of balls in the air, just like you do. You've got a lot of things going on. And I find when I have to make decisions about what to do and what to put aside, I'm going to do the things to make sure that I don't let down or humiliate myself in front of the students that I see three times a week, as opposed to the person in Australia who I've never met before. And I don't really care that much what they think about me. Or I'm going to. I'm going to try to not let down the colleagues that are down the hall from me, as opposed to, yeah, these somewhat nameless academics. So ideally, you wouldn't be letting anyone down. But there's a lot of pressures on us all, and there's uh, a lot of things um, uh, going on. And uh, you can't kill yourself for not fulfilling all your uh, 
your, um, your obligations because um, they're, they're not, like, like you were saying, Carrie, they're not quite as important as they seem, as they seem in, the, in the moment. So don't worry about the deadlines in your classes anymore. <laughs> that's, anyway, that's, uh, uh, that's the tip of the iceberg, but that's all I'm willing to reveal to you right now. So that's, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> So next we have Chris Helland, uh, an associate professor in the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology. Thank you. Thanks. You know him back. Yeah. Is that good, Spencer? I got it. Okay, so I'm going to freeform a bit also. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to give the talk. Uh, it was an interesting issue when you think about failure and success. Um, because often I think about how lucky I am that I actually have such a great job, that I have such a great opportunity to be at Dalhousie. I'm coming up on my 15th year. I'm starting my next uh, sabbatical, full year sabbatical starts very soon. Um, I've been able to do incredible things, travel the world, research, um, amazing places, hang out with, the, you know, even the Dalai Lama, right, which is just amazing. So it feels like I've been very lucky. And when I had the opportunity to think about it, um, you know, you realize it's not so much luck as it is about the right effort. So I do want to talk about my failures because they're actually quite catastrophic. In fact, I have failure written all over me, right? You can see it like everywhere. My first tattoo was when I was 18. Uh, my last tattoo was supposed to be this morning, but the fellow that was supposed to do it thought would be surfing, so he didn't, he rescheduled, so it will be on Tuesday. That's when I get my next tattoo. So lots of bad decisions, right? Actually catastrophic decisions um, that have been really not well thought out and I'm very fortunate again, but I don't want to say lucky that I've gotten to be where I've, where I've gotten. So some of the bad decisions I've made, um, just a couple of them that I'll share, certainly was not finishing high school, right? And grade 12, uh, just at the last minute, I had a job that paid so-so and just decided not to complete my grade 12, right? Catastrophically bad decision. Um, that was one of them. Um, there's some other ones. I ended up just like Eli, you know, we talk about the bad side of the law. I um, backpacked around through North America, ended up in Mexico, ended up hanging out with some very, um, what you would probably call bad people, doing bad things in the drug sort of world, and ended up in prison in Mexico. And my mother and the Canadian consulate had to get me out of jail, and it was not easy. Right? So these are catastrophically bad decisions. So I wanted to think about, well, how did I actually end up you know, being successful, because I certainly was not on the right path uh, to get there. So there were a few things that came up, um, and one of them, first off, I want to talk about another failure, though, and this was one of my early failures that I had at school. It was grade four, and I'll remember it because I sat there crying, right? And that was in grade four when the teacher pulled me aside. I am dyslexic, but back then I don't think anyone really cared, and I could never get the right there. Is it T-H-I-E-R? Is that there? Is it T-H-E-I-R? Is it T-H-E-R-E? Is it T-H-E-Y apostrophe R-E? I still have trouble with that. Um, and that's just dyslexia. But I remember in grade four, I was actually pulled aside and I was told, if you can't do this, we're going to hold you back a year. And back then, they actually failed you. And back then, there were a lot of really big grade six kids. And I did not want to be one of those really big grade six kids hanging out in the lunchroom. Um, so I can remember just crying. I said, no, no, I'll get it. And I went home and I tried to study and I just can't spell. Right? So it was really touch and go, but that was just, it was enormous. And I somehow just passed because there was one spelling test. I was told if you don't pass this spelling test, you are not going on to grade five. Right? So at that time, it was absolutely just you know, devastating. But I somehow just pulled my socks up. I got it together. Um, and, and when I reflect on it now and all the sort of little catastrophes I've had in life, um, the thing that comes up is that I just, I'm either too stupid to know when to quit or I'm just smart enough to know, you know when you can't give up. Right? So I like to think maybe I'm on the side that's just smart enough to know that you just don't give up. Right? The rewards are too great. You, can just, you cannot quit at that time. So it you know, just, just doesn't matter what the struggle is, just keep at it. Right? Um, so I have had a lot of success. Um, I think that's, I, I'm not really sure where I wanted to go with the full thing. I have a couple other things I want to talk about though, and that was just about the luck thing. So I was very fortunate when I, when I finally, um, you know, I did different jobs, did different things. When I was 25, I decided I would go to university. 
right? Um, and at that point, I had a great opportunity because my mother's a professor and she was out on the East Coast and then she was at Concordia. And she said, if your life ever changes, if things shift around and you want to go back to school, you can have a tuition waiver, you can come to Montreal, go to Concordia, right? That's something you can do. And I, at that time, all these things were going on. I decided that's what I want to do because I did have a passion for studying the so, sort of um, social power of religion and society and the supernatural sort of stuff. And that was something I'm just fascinated in. So I decided, well, if I can actually make that my job, that I get to study this stuff, then I will be, you know, I'll be happy in life. That's what I want to do. So I gave it all up and, and I went for it. Um, and when I wrote my PhD dissertation, I had first started studying millennial movements because this was towards the end of 2000 and I was doing a lot of work on it. And, um, but I had always been, you know, I, I call myself, honestly, I call myself a bit of a slackademic. Have you ever heard that term, a slackademic? Because I do have a lot of grants, I have a lot of publications, I seem to be successful, but then I'm also out surfing, I'm playing video games late at night, I'm not, you know, doing the best I should be doing at marking. You know, those comments, you know, some of my students will know, maybe I should have a better rubric. Um, so I'm a bit of a slackademic, but somehow, you know, things, you know, just with that amount of effort, um, things have worked out well. And uh, for my PhD at the time, it was 1999, and the internet was still fairly new, and online activity was fairly new, and I was a gamer. I loved being online. I loved gaming. I was reading all the cyber fiction, all the cyberpunk. I loved it. Neil Stevenson, um, just, just totally immersed in this world of, of online activity and just watching the culture develop. It was absolutely fascinating to just watch culture develop in front of me, online activity. Like it was new and it was incredible. And there was religious activity going on. And at that time, no one was really looking at it. People thought that because technology was scientific and it was modern, that religion just wouldn't be there. When in fact, the first study uh, looking at religion on the internet found there were three times as many websites concerning God and spirituality than there were concerning sex. So it was huge, but it was sort of ignored. So I decided I would do my PhD dissertation on it. Right? And that was a good move because I was one of the first people to do that. And at that time, there was no theoretical frameworks for studying it, so I developed one. As a PhD student in my first class on method and theory, I wrote a theory to classify online religious participation. And, and as I was working on this theory, my supervisor at the time, a fellow named Lauren Dawson, was also studying the internet. And I asked him, I said, you know, I've got this theory, but I need some more information on, you know, religion and the internet. And he told me, he said, well, I'm working on this, you know, I'm adding a chapter to this book that's being done by this guy named Jeff Hayden, who was one of the greatest sociology of religion people at the time. And he said, and this is my supervisor, he told me this, he said, but once it's done, once it's edited, I'll give you a copy of my chapter and you can look at it. But I'm, I'm not going to, you know, we'll wait till the book's out. You know, just sort of, you know, just leave it at that. But for me, again, you know, if I think about right time, right place, um, at that time, it just, there was no theory and I had this idea. So what I did without telling my supervisors, I actually emailed Jeffrey Hayden and I sent him a copy of my theory and I said, this is it. This is, you know, it makes sense. And, and, and this was a big move, it was a bold move. I'd never even met him, right? But I sent it anyways. Um, and I didn't hear back and it was about two weeks and I thought, well, that was pretty dumb of me to be so bold to do that, right? And just, I just sort of left it at that. Normally I wouldn't give up, but I just thought, you know, I'd crossed the line, I pushed it a little too far. Um, but actually, in fact, what had happened is that Hayden had been away and he'd been sort of incommunicado and he got back and as soon as he saw it, he actually emailed me right away and he said, listen, Chris, I've, I've, saw, I've seen your theory and it's really important that we get that in the book. So the other editor is going to work with you. We're already, the book's already done, but we're going to put your theory in the book. So you've got to get that chapter ready. So this was a shock. I was very happy about that. My supervisor was not so happy, right? Because there's going to be tension now. Um, but the theory got in the book and I thought, this is great. And when they sent the draft of the book to me and I opened the introduction at the first paragraph of that book, Jeffrey Hayden writing says, talking, he says, the first thing you have to understand about the religion, about religion and the internet is Christopher Helen's theory about this, this, this. And I just saw this and I just, just couldn't even believe it, right? Um, just blew my mind, right? But that was it. So when I think about it and then I thought, well, wow, was I ever lucky that I had that opportunity, you know? Um, but it wasn't luck, right? It was right time because the internet was new, it was the right place, it was at the University of Toronto, which is an amazing place to do your PhD, and then it was the right amount of effort, right? It was the right amount of effort. And what I realized when I was thinking about this talk, and I appreciated, you know, just having to think about it, was that those are the three things, the right time, um, right place, and right effort. But of those things, the first two, you have no idea if it's the right time and the right place. You have no control over that. All you have control over is your effort. Right? So just giving it the effort you have, right, 
just going for it, right? And then, and then I'll just fall back and say that again, you know? Um, you know, if you're too stupid to know when to quit, or is it that you're just smart enough to know when you shouldn't give up, right? It's the effort thing was, the, was what I feel was what got me to where I am. Surprisingly, still alive, happy, somehow successful, right? So that's my, my little two cents worth. So thank you, Liesl, and hope that's helpful. So next we have um, Anna Stamberger, who is the head coach of the Dalhousie Varsity Women's Basketball Team. Okay. Yeah. Woo. Okay. Are we still connected? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, Thank you very much, Liesl, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, these guys are pros. Uh, I am out of my comfort zone completely. Uh, put me in the middle of a gym, uh, lots of people around, and in the middle of a game, and everything's great. I'm happy. Um, so I've got you know notes. I've got slideshow. I'm like good to go. Uh, these guys are just blowing my mind coming up here, and you know saying all these great things. Uh, and how do you remember all those things? Like, I've got a memory of a goldfish, so I have to have everything. And my son already informed me, Mom, that doesn't make sense. It's, it's supposed to be arrows going back and forth, and he couldn't change it. And he said, what are you using? And so on. So anyway, failed already, first slide. Um, so, um, but anyway, I'm very glad to be here because, uh, you know, I, I don't know, Liesl, if you sort of went, I know you wanted to have a coach. You had a coach last year, and if you went to the uh, AUS standings or the DAL website or something and found the most losing coach this season, and you said, that's my girl, because that's kind of how it worked out, but we're, we're good. It's, it's all good. We're going to learn from this, right? So, um, anyway. Um, so for me, uh, failure is, is, you know, obviously you don't want to fail and nobody wants to when it's not fun and all that kind of thing, but we can turn it around. Uh, and athletes, as athletes, uh, student athletes and coaches and so on, we're very fortunate in that um, we get a lot of practice at that. We, we lose drills, we lose little competitions, we lose games, we lose championships, we lose big, that, that's just a part of life. Uh, so I think we really, uh, you know, the game of basketball and competition and at a high level, at a low level, there's, it, it correlates very uh, well to life in general. So we learn a lot from that. Um, so for me, failure, obviously, you know, things like loss, frustration, uh, inadequacy, that's all sort of like normally connected or associated with failure, with the word failure. But you can turn that around to uh, opportunity to explore, um, opportunity to learn, and opportunities to improve. Uh, and that's what we as student athletes and as coaches um, are constantly doing. We, we need to do that, like that's because we, you know, that, that's just part of what we do is uh, fail and learn from it and move on and, and try to improve. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, one thing is like we always are trying to find the silver lining in every situation, you know, and the thing I'm saying to my husband, you know, like, oh, we're getting so old. How is that possible? Like, I feel like I'm 30 and like we're pushing getting like 60 kind of thing like I can't believe it that's just I can't like, every birthday I'm just so you know I'm just thinking like it can't be true like I feel like does anybody know friends it's like my favorite anyway so uh you know Joey when they all turn 30 and Joey's crying all the time and everything well I can totally relate to that so except like well, I'm coming up to 60 and I still I'm in I'm in shock so um but uh and my husband then very clearly points out to me he says um he said well it's better than the alternative you know, and I'm like, I kind of, what, what are you talking? How can it be better to get older? And then I realize what he's saying, you know, if you're not getting older, you're dead. So it's better than the alternative. So there's always that silver lining, even to getting old, as I learned. Um, and, and the other thing is you can turn things around and learn from them. So another example is, you know, obviously none of you would have heard maybe, um, oh, but by the way, I wanted to say, Chris, like, I think you were, even if you did go all the way through to grade six, I'm sure you were one of those huge grade six kids. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think getting all the way to grade six, you know, in the proper chronological order helped you not being one of those big grade six kids. Anyway, um, but uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was a, you know, um, oh gosh, what was his name uh, before? Anyway, 
Uh, he uh, was a, a, a famous icon NBA star, uh, seven foot center and so on and so forth. Uh, Liesl will know him um, or know of him. And, uh, but he played for, in the late 60s, he played for um, John Wooden uh, at UCLA uh, and they were part of a, a huge winning dynasty and so on. And he was very frustrated because when he went to university, he was dunking already in high school. He was a phenomenal superstar. He was going to change the game. He had already changed it in high school. He was was going to change it at the college level and um, he uh, then they made a rule and of course you can imagine in the mid 60s <coughs> late 60s there were very few uh, African American players at uh, students at college players uh, in the uh, NCAA so they and he was just going to dominate and he was phenomenal and so on uh, and they then brought in a rule no dunking no dunking allowed because of course, he was just gonna make everyone look silly because he was just this amazing player and amazing at, at slamming and dunking and so on. And so they brought in rule when, when he came. And so he was very frustrated. He talked to John Wooden about that, his coach. And he said, it's just not right, it's not fair. They're just trying to hold me back. They don't want me to dominate. And of course, rightfully so. He, he, what he was saying was all correct, unfortunately, it was all correct. Um, so, um, so then John Wooden said, well, let's, let's see what we can do about that. He said, don't worry about it. He said, in two years, you're gonna be in the NBA anyway. There's no rules. He said, let's see what we can do, how we can turn that around into a positive. So they developed, they worked on, and they developed the famous, world famous hook shot. He would never have had his hook shot. And he then became even, of course, then when he went to the NBA and played 20 years in the NBA till he was 40, I saw him play live. Um, he, um, every, you know, more and more people could dunk, of course. It wasn't such a big thing, but nobody had the hook shot that he had, the, the, the sky hook that he had. And he was unstoppable between dunking and the sky hook. He would never have had the hook shot if, if they had allowed him to dunk all through college. So it's just one of those things that you, you turn things around. Um, the Beauty of Discomfort. This is a book, I don't know, has anybody heard of it? <laughs> you got your hands up. I forced them to read that this summer. So, um, two of my student athletes, um, who I forced to come here in case people didn't know. Um, uh, no, but um, The Beauty of Discomfort by Amanda Lang. It's an amazing book. Um, I, I don't know where I got my hands on it, but this, this pa last spring I read it and, uh, and I said, oh, this is our summer reading for my team. So I had my student athletes read that this summer and then at our team building in September, we discussed it and broke it down chapter by chapter. It's got a similar thing to The Outliers. Don't know. Um, anyway, uh, it, it's an amazing message of uh, instead of learn, uh, wanting to avoid discomfort, uh, embrace it uh, and welcome it. Um, you know, and student athletes seek discomfort or constantly challenge themselves with their training, with setting their, you know, goals and so on. They're constantly setting high goals and then not achieving them. So they're, you know, training. So we, we that's what we do is we seek discomfort out. Um, and there was a famous, uh, I think it's a football coach that he brings his first years in. I'm going to start doing it next, next year. Um, he brings his uh, first years in and they have a meeting and he says, okay, you, you get to choose right now. You need to make a decision. Do you want the pain of, um, what is it? The pain of, that's all not goldfish, the pain of disappointment or the pain of discipline? Either way, you're getting pain. I mean, the pain of disappointment would be, obviously, you don't want to be disciplined or you don't want to, be, uh, to work very hard and it comes about the effort. Um, then, uh, then you're probably going to be exiting out that side door, uh, not with the program for very long. Um, and if you want the pain of discipline, you will continue to play and improve and, and train with us and so on and so forth and have uh, a career or an experience at our program. Um, but of course there will be pain. So the thing is, and, and I'm not talking about physical pain, I'm not talking about p playing through physical pain. That, that's not what I'm encouraging at all. I'm talking about discomfort um, and uh, hard work, which is important and not always easy. So uh, it's just, sometimes people are looking for the easy way out or the easy path and, and, and uh, I, I would discourage that. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's okay to struggle um, and, and I won't stand up here and talk about all my failures because it's just, you know, it's a lot and, and uh, um, I, think, I think for me the bigger message is failing is a part of life. Uh, learn from it, embrace it uh, and move on. Uh, that's that's my, the main part of my uh, 
message. Um, my mission in life, and I, I've tried to instill this in my, my own children, and I've been trying to instill it in my, my student athletes that I coach, uh, have integrity, uh, work as hard as you can, and help others. Um, to me, that's, that's my mission in life. Uh, it, it, nothing about win a championship and go to the Worlds or to the Olympics. Or, that is not what I have in my... Uh, would I like to win a championship? Are we working hard to win a championship? Absolutely. Um, it's not something that I measure myself by. Um, I measure myself and my performance by, by other things. So um, that is what I've tried to instill in, in my own children as well as my, my student athletes. Because um, I think if you can do those three things, you, you're, you're um, on your way to having a very successful life. Um, this, these are the 2017-18 Tigers uh, women's basketball pro, uh, team and they are a fantastic group of uh, young women who I enjoy working with uh, tremendously. Uh, they are one of my favorite groups without doubt. I've played on a lot of teams, I've coached a lot of teams. Um, since you know, almost 60, so um, that, that you get a lot of teams in in that time. And uh, I played competitively until I was 42 uh, as a professional athlete. So played on a lot of teams, been involved with a lot, and, and this is absolute uh, top top three of my teams. Uh, but um, the journey, we are, uh, and like I said, Lise will probably check the standards, the records, and we are five and ten at the moment. We have five game league games left. We are fighting tooth and nail. Um, and we have a, a small window of opportunity to make playoffs, AUS playoffs. We're a young team, but um, so like, you know, some, some coaches may be fired for that record. Um, and like this is, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's tough road, tough road, you know, hard times, uh, but uh, enjoyable, absolutely. Uh, I love this team and w one of the top teams I've worked with at Dal and, and in general, um, because I see tremendous potential. Uh, we are improving every week and we're developing a, a championship culture. So championship culture is, is a lot about performance. So we're improving. We are looking at, you know, wanting to play near our maximum potential, reach our potential. Uh, and we're building strong, positive relationships with respect for each other. And this is, and I think you can take that right out of a team setting into you know, faculty and a classroom setting as well as a work environment and, you know, it's, it's about relationships um, and obviously we all are, you know, I bring it back to always to that and, and the word effort is just, it's all about effort and bringing your best performance, your best effort forward um, so you can be happy with your performance because it's all about doing the best that you possibly can do and putting the time in and so, you know, and not getting upset or worried about things um, without putting the effort in. Um, but then also at the same time, not spending so much, like be in the moment, not spending so much time thinking about the results that I had last week or whatever, or the results that I'm worried about we will get or won't have or whatever, like that's sort of a waste of time. Put your, be in the moment, put your uh, efforts towards uh, working hard and uh, I think um, things have a tendency to work out. Um, there's no such thing as a work-life balance. Everything worth fighting for on balance is your life. So I just thought these, these two kids here, uh, two of our young players are fighting hard for possession of the basketball. We're in the black uniform. By the way, we're playing tomorrow night and it's our Shoot for the Cure pink game. So come on out and watch uh, Ro and Ashley um, take on CBU, Cape Breton. Um, but anyway, um, of course, uh, you know, the ups and downs, uh, is, it's a part of life. Uh, we get to experience that a lot on the court and, and in the season in a competitive environment, but it, it correlates to, to life in general. Like we, we, we experience it also off the court, uh, ups and downs and, um, and, and, you know, use a lot of positive self-talk to attack the self-doubt that is in everybody, especially women, uh, everybody's minds. Um, and, you know, those, those gnawing self-doubt thoughts that come, like, you, you, we need to attack that with positive self-talk. Um, and, and we learn that as student-athletes. Um, and in this, uh, you know, this, this whole situation, finding opportunities to grow. Uh, and that's where failure comes in because you grow the most. So, you know, so when my daughter, who's, who's a professional basketball player as well, playing in Europe, um, and she played here at Dal as well, um, 
you know, and she says, so how are, how are things going and everything? I said, oh, great, great. We're, we're growing and learning a lot, a lot. It's really great. She goes, uh-huh, uh-huh. She knows exactly what, what I'm talking about. So, but, you know, we, like, we're used to challenging ourselves. And I think sometimes people that don't have that experience with varsity or with, with athletic competition, um, they're not used to challenging themselves and putting them outside the box. You know, when Liesl spoke to me about doing this, I'm like, okay, this is not my comfort zone, but I am going to do this because we're just used to putting ourselves outside our comfort zone and you know these guys are just so pro right and I'm sitting here thinking okay <laughs> self-doubt self-doubt but anyway yeah so but I said I got my slides I'm just gonna press those buttons um, but anyway finding opportunities to grow this this young lady uh, did a fantastic job uh, emceeing for our big event uh, last year um, in front of 350 guests top administrative uh, people from the university. Uh, Liesl, you were there. I don't know if you were there this time, but you were at one of our events. And um, she, I, I brought her into my office and I said, okay, so um, Ashley, I want you to do this. And she's like, no, no, I can't do that, coach. And I said, yeah, you can do that. 100% you can do that. Anyway, she did a phenomenal job, uh, but it was a challenge for her. Uh, and I think she grew a lot that night. Then the next day she wrote me this email, and this is for me, uh, really uh, um, says this means a lot to me and I, I, I have saved this email um, and, and this is to me worth way more than you know having a winning record season to me this is there's a lot of different ways to win uh, and so I really enjoyed uh, getting this email um, you know that she wanted to thank me for the wonderful opportunity and and some people uh, before me Chris and and Eli mentioned the the being grateful and this is a huge part of dealing with failure is 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 being grateful for your situation whatever it may be and there's always something to be grateful even in very hard times. Uh, well, I don't know about prison in Mexico. That would be a hard one. I haven't been there. So I, I'm thinking that's a hard one to find the silver lining in. But, um, but um, there is always something to be grateful for. And being grateful and, and, and realizing um, what you can appreciate uh, is a huge part to making yourself happy. Uh, and, and that's very important. And a lot of people, they like to sort of dwell on what's not going well or what's not working. And um, sometimes you just have to think, but okay, so I failed that exam or I failed that course or, or whatever the situation, but, but what can I be grateful for? Um, so for, for me, and of course, failure isn't always negative. Uh, you know, my, my philosophy is a great work ethic uh, and a positive attitude uh, equals opportunity to grow, improve, and learn. And, and this has been my whole life, and, and, and it's shaped my life and my career. Uh, so I did fail forward to the Olympics uh, as, in 1984, competed for Canada, which was, you know, I mean, I was telling my son when I was, he was criticizing my... Uh, giving me feedback about my slides that um, I, uh, you know, it was like almost a miracle that I, that I got to the uh, Olympics because I mean, I, I just had those types of expressions told to me all the time, which was fine. I was just getting feedback. They were telling me and it, they were all true, but I learned, okay, I'm not fast enough. Okay, I, I got to get faster. Oh, I'm not big enough. I got to change to a different position. Okay, then I've got to learn this other position. So, you know, I, I you know, like, the great Jack Dunn, who uh, men's national team coach, uh, said, it's not what happens to you, it's how you deal with what happens to you. So, you know, take action and uh, learn from it and, and move, move on. Um, there was it, the, the story about Cut Pendergast, that's my maiden name, uh, was up with a national team and he uh, just kept me uh, as an alternate it was a three-day tryout, kept me as an alternate because I was big, physical, strong player. He said, oh, well, the, you'll be a great practice player. Just, you're just going to practice for the week to get us ready, and, and I'm not going to keep you. And I said, okay, that, but I was thrilled because I got to stay and practice with the best players in Canada, uh, amazing situation, and learn from the best coaches. So I just was happy. I didn't really think about what's coming ahead. And, uh, but then and every day he said on his training uh, practice plan, the last three days, at the bottom of his practice plan, he had written down, cut Pendergast today. Uh, and he said three days, and then, then he told me this on the flight to Taiwan, that I went, made the trip for their first big tournament in Taiwan uh, in 19, whatever, 80 something, 82. Um, and uh, he said, I, I had it written on my practice plan, but he said, you just 
got better and better and he said you just worked so hard and you never got tired and you like and it was the effort it was the effort again uh and he's that, that chris talked about and he said i just i just couldn't do it he said i just had to take you so he said but but he said and we had a meeting on the plane to taiwan and he said um he said but you're not good enough to be on this team and I'm like, okay, I got the Canada uniform in my bag. And I was like, you couldn't say, you could not bring me off of that cloud. And I said, okay. And he said, you're not going to play. And I said, okay. And he said, you're just going to practice and whatever. And I said, okay. And like, you know, all this stuff. And um, so, but I was then uh, in our first game, I was the first player he brought in off the bench on into the court. I have no idea why um, after all that, you know. Um, anyway, so... Uh, you know, life is like a camera. Focus on what's important. Capture the good times. Develop from the negatives. If things don't turn out, take another shot. You know, that's, uh, I, I was cut from lots of teams. I didn't make, or I forgot to add, I didn't make the PEI provincial team. I mean, PEI's got like 50,000 people in it. And there's probably only about 20 people play basketball. But somehow I did not make my uh, provincial under 17 or under 18 basketball team. I wasn't good enough. So fine. Then I come to Dal and they're telling me you're not going to make the Dal team. And then they even told the Dal coach, uh, she's not, she's going there like this, whatever, you know, the 5'11 girl from Kensington. She's not, not going to make your team though. She's not good enough to make your team. So th that was always, uh, but you just, uh, um, you know, move on and, and bring the effort. Um, this is just one of my favorite slides, really not to do with this. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, it's bossy or is it leadership? Like, it's how do you frame it? You know, how do you, um, I just love that slide, so. Um, anyway, yeah, this is, Chris helped me do this, put it together. Uh, to sum it up, um, there is an ending to this. Um, to sum it up, uh, I, the girls will tell you, I'm used to a two hour practice, so this is kind of a new thing, 10 minutes, so. Um, to sum it up, I have this little uh, YouTube. I don't know if, if uh, people saw the Super Bowl. I'm not a football person myself. I know Liesl is <laughs> and her dad. Um, but um, that uh, Nick Foles, uh, I guess the interesting thing about this is uh, he, uh, up until about six weeks before the Super Bowl, um, I allowed my son to educate me about this, um, he, uh, he was not not he hadn't played for two years almost. He was a backup quarterback and his quarterback that he was backing up was a superstar and, but then he got injured. Uh, so this guy, you know, basically then was getting his opportunity um, after, you know, obviously not being good enough. And, you know, uh, so, and then they, you know, upset the big, um, the Patriots uh, superstars. And uh, so we'll see if we can hear what he has to say. Chris? <laughs> going to work okay inside one i think the big thing is don't get should i turn it down in our society today, you know instagram twitter so i like um you know it's all the good things and then when you look at it you know you think like wow when you have a real fear your life's not as good as that like you know you're failing you know failure is part of life that's a part of building character and growing like without failure who would you be i wouldn't be up here if i had fallen thousands of times, made mistakes. We're all human, we all have weaknesses, and I think throughout this, just being able to share that and be transparent. I know when I listen to people speak and they share their weaknesses, I'm listening, because I can resonate. So I'm not perfect, I'm not Superman. We might be in the NFL and we might have just won the Super Bowl, but hey, we still have daily struggles, I still have daily struggles, so. Um, but that's where my faith comes in, that's where my family comes in, and, you know, I think when you look at a struggle in your life, just know that, you know, that's just an opportunity for your character to grow. And that's really just been the message. Yeah, so, um, and I guess what they're, what, I, I just picked the short um, one of it. I don't know how to stop all of this, but, oh, okay. Pause, 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 right, right, right. The girls are laughing. <laughs> um, okay, um, so um, I, I guess there was a longer, I just took the concise one minute part of that interview, but there was, a, you can look it up on YouTube and it's like two and a half minute interview or whatever, but, and they were asking him, but what are you going to do when, when this, you know, other better uh, quarterback gets healthy, then you're going to be back, 
you know, at the back of the bench kind of thing in the back, back of the back of the lineup kind of thing. And, and you're, you know, you've just been the MVP of the tournament, you have the Super Bowl, you're, you know, you're all this and then, and then you're going to be at the back of the bus again. Uh, so what about what, what's, how's that going to feel? What, they're, they're asking him that. And he said, you know, he said, I'm just, I'm just happy to be here. I'm just, I'm grateful for the experience and I'm, I'm just living in the moment. You know, he went on to say that and it's, you know, it's so, it's so true. Uh, I think he, he summed it up really well. So I'm going to close on that. Um, Anna's right. I did have uh, the men's soccer coach here last year, and I wanted Anna this year. I went right for you. I didn't check the record. Um, but because of what she said, that athletes uh, have to, they fail all the time. So if you can't learn how to, you know, dust yourself off and keep going, then who better, you know, to help put things in perspective. And she's sneaky, this one. Uh, she gets them to read a book in the summer <laughs> to discuss in the fall. So I'm wondering how to do that. <laughs> so um, I'll see. I'm afraid this is going to. No, it won't. Um, it's not going to start, is it, Chris? It's not going to just start playing, is it, Chris? Just X. Can you just text it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, I should have finished my job. Oops. Now it's me. Okay. Um, oh, no, I did it again. <laughs> yeah, failing, failing, failing. Um, Oh, sorry. I could just. <coughs> yeah. Did it? No, oh, that's okay. <laughs> okay, so. Last but not least, um, we will finish um, and have Emily Varto, who's a professor in the Classics Department as well, um, give the final presentation of the evening. So, you and your bag of tricks. <laughs> All right, this is why women's clothes need pockets. Hanging on to this thing. Let's see if I can stick her in there. Nope, we'll just stick her there. That works. Um, hi, so I'm Emily Varto. I work in the classics department. Um, and when Liesl sent me the email asking if I'd be part of this, I didn't want to do it. I took a couple days. I didn't want to do it. Um, I am happy to be here. And I'll explain why, uh, why at the end. Um, so yeah, one of the reasons I didn't really, uh, or why I had to think about it, uh, was because it makes me feel really vulnerable to talk about my fail failures, to talk about things that are really terribly personal uh, in front of this sort of an audience. Um, I'm not the kind of kid who got arrested. I was the kind of kid who slayed exams. Um, I was pretty tense. I was a little bit Lisa Simpson. Um, had trouble with frustration. Um, frustrated easily. Put the effort in, get frustrated. Um, so I'm still kind of vulnerable um, and, and don't really feel like talking about really lots of personal things. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is, um, well, because, you know, in the academic world, as, as Eli mentioned, it, it's full of criticism, right? It's just one of these things. You do have to learn how to deal with it, how to uh, to get through it as a student, as a graduate student, as a professor, it never really stops. You are, your work is in judgment, and I want to kind of emphasize it's your work that's in judgment, it's not you, right? And that's sometimes a really hard distinction to make, and I still work on making that distinction. Um, and that also in this world, you know, where reputation is really very important, right? It's your name that goes on your work, right? It's your reputation. People get to know you. Stories of your failure can actually have real consequences. So, like, I, I love this. I love how enlightened this is. 
but I am a cynic at heart and I just kind of know that there are people out there who will sometimes use your failures against you. Um, and hopefully I could talk about a couple of things, strategies that I use um, to try to combat those sorts of fears that I, that I have about that sort of thing. Um, so instead of personal anecdotes and stories, um, I decided to bring some material things, um, which hopefully can convince you of the reality of what I'm saying. So instead of personal anecdotes as proof, I'm going with material stuff because I like archaeology and ancient things, so we're going that way. Okay, uh, so the first item I want to start with, um, and honestly, a lot of this is just stuff I pulled out, out of my office. It's this little note that I've had taped up on my bulletin board for a very long time. It's a little comic, and it says, success, what people think it is, straight arrow upward, right? Success, what it really looks like, arrow all the squiggly lines upward, right? And I have this. You can actually see the little holes. I've had this up on my bulletin board for a really quite a long time. Um, and so what I want to talk about uh, today is what do you do in that squiggly part? What do you do in all that effort you've put in? gets you to the squiggles and not to the upward arrow, right? Because that happens. You know, as much as we can put in that effort, you know, when you try hard and sometimes you give it a your all and you still don't get there, you're still in the squiggles. So I want to talk about what we do when we're in that spot or maybe, I'm not, I don't want to say I'm an expert, but I have experience and these are some of the things that have worked for me um, when I've been in the squiggles. Um, so what to do, you know, when you're in the squiggles. Um, the first item is nothing. And it's nothing for all of the emails I've never sent and all of the phone calls I've never made. Uh, so the first piece of advice is don't write that email right away. You know, you get feedback, sit on it, go for a walk, get away from it. You get a paper back and it's not what you wanted. Breathe, don't rush up to the prof immediately, right? Usually your first instinct isn't the best one. Take some time, step away from it. Um, never send an email you've written at 4 a.m. It's never a good idea, ever, right? Write the email if you have to, never send it. Even if, like, don't write it in your email thing just in case you're tempted to even send it or accidentally send it. Write it in your other, some sort of word processor. So that's the first item, right? Talk to friends and family about it, write it out, but don't act on it right away. Uh, the second item is actually an item. It's my cell phone where I have a podcast player. This is what I do to get, a, get back to sleep at 4 a.m. when it wakes me up. All right? I can be a high-stress person sometimes, and my brain will be overactive and run over all the failures I did, all the stupid things I might have said in the day, whatever dumb thing I did tonight I'm going to think about at 4 o'clock in the morning tomorrow. Um, when that happens, I turn on a podcast, and that's how I turn my brain off. Um, sometimes I'll tell myself a story. Right? Instead of reviewing this thing that is bothering me, instead of those annoying comments I got in the latest article I submitted. Um, find something to get myself back to sleep because sleep is so important. Everything is better after a night's sleep. Again, it's the same kind of 4 a.m. principle. Nothing is good at 4 a.m. Everything seems dark. So try to get some sleep. And that's one of the ways that I've, I've found has really helped for me. And not screens, right? So I, I don't watch TV. I don't, when I listen to a podcast, it's some boring linguistics podcast because it's just interesting enough to keep my attention, but not so interesting or controversial that I actually will get worked up about it. So something kind of interesting, but a little bit bland with no loud music. And I will usually fall back asleep to that. Okay. Um, next item. A lot of this is about kind of getting the emotion out of the, the initial shock, perhaps. This is some piano music. Um, recently in my career, I had a bit of a setback, and uh, I was quite frustrated. And so I played a lot of really angry piano. Um, it was just something physical to do to kind of to get the stress out. Um, now, this is a sonatina, not meant to be played angrily at all. Uh, so basically, I was playing things like Bach like it was Berlioz, right? Like big honking trumpet romantic stuff when it's supposed to be tinkly, baroque, pretty stuff. Um, but there was something about that physicality of it. Uh, I also went to the gym and I punched a lot of those punching bags. Um, just something. Exercise is great, but it doesn't have to be exercise. It could be painting. I've pulled dandelions in my backyard sometimes when I've been writing grant applications. Just something to physically physically do something, to move my body, whether it's painting, 
pulling dandelions, angry piano music, something like that. Um, next item, see if I can find it in the bag here. Ah, there it is. It's also musical. On an ongoing basis, uh, this is something I kind of had to learn to kind of counteract my Lisa Simpson tendencies. Um, consider doing things you don't have to be the best at. Right? Pick up a hobby that you're actually really terrible at, or at least terrible at first at. And it's so, it's so relaxing. It, it's, such a, it's such a great thing to do. It, it's um, refreshing right? to do something just for joy. And you might get better at it, but you don't have to. Right? So for me, that was learning the oboe. I picked up the oboe a couple years ago, and I'm really honky, um, really quite honky. But I have fun and it's a good time. And I don't have to be perfect at it, I don't have to be best at it, I don't have to lead a class in it, right? I can play second oboe for the rest of my life and that I would be happy with. So doing something that you don't have to be good at, that you do just for laughs or for joy or whatever, it's so rewarding because it kind of trains you to be okay with not being good at stuff. It's, and it's fun, right? Not having that stress of it. Um, okay, getting to some of the more practical things. Say you get, um, there you go. Say you get some feedback on an essay. Uh, my equivalent is getting some feedback um, from an article I might have submitted. Um, and Eli alluded to this, that often the comments you get are very grouchy. I actually got a set of comments back where the, the editor of the journal is like, um, this review is kind of grouchy, which was good. I'm so glad he said that because when I read it, it was appalling, but it was the tone that was appalling. It wasn't the comments themselves. So there are a lot of people who deliver feedback really very poorly, and a lot of them are in academia. Um, there are TAs who are learning to grade, there are professors who are having an off day, uh, there are academics, you know, taking pot shots at each other's work, or just, you know, couching things in not the most uh, helpful manner. So you kind of have to learn how to deal with all of that feedback. Sometimes it comes back, comes in a really good package, other times it's really comes in a terrible package, it's really quite shitty. Um, so one of the things that I, I read about when I was in this situation was distilling, distilling the feedback. Um, there was a couple, there's a slide up there that was kind of similar to this idea that you take that feedback and you, you, you make of it what you can, you turn it to be helpful. Right? So I went through that review when I was calm and I had played angry piano and I'd done all the other things and I went through and I distilled. I pulled out the important things that would help me improve my article. Got rid of all the negativity in there and just said, these are the action things that I can do, and this is what I'm gonna do. And from, when, from then on, whenever I worked on the article again, I went back to my own list of things I could do. And it didn't get me down, it actually helped me. This is, this is how you get from you know, failure to learning, right? What is that in-between bit? Right? This is one of the, the techniques, and it was really, really good. I'm really glad that I, I ran across that suggestion. The second bit is just getting back to work. Right? It's that effort thing. You go back to it. You get back into it. Um, another post-it I have in my office um, says, inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up and get to work. Right? Don't wait to like, you know, have some Mozart moment. That's not actually how most work gets done. Right? It's showing up. You, know, you show up on the basketball court, or you show up at your desk every day, or you open up your ancient Greek textbook, perhaps, again, one more time, and work at it. Right? So it's, it's showing up and getting back into it. So I really like this little post-it. Uh, next bit. If that is hard, and that can be hard after you've had a setback, you know, you, get, you work on that article really hard and you're really proud of it, comes back, somebody's grocery review, you feel demoralized. Uh, well, when I, I hit a rough patch in the middle of my PhD where I just wanted to do anything but a PhD and run off and, I don't know, save the world or whales or something, I don't know. Um, my PhD super kind of, supervisor kind of freaked out. Well, he didn't freak out. He's like, oh, okay, right, what are we going to do about this? This is, you know, you're, you're kind of going a little off the wall here. Um, and what he told me is to stop doing all of the acad other academic things I was doing and take two months, which is it's two to three months, which is really a good thing for a supervisor to say. And he said, do whatever it is, read whatever it is you want to read that's going to get you back to why you want to do this in the first place. Right? 
So I'm a huge nerd. Um, so I decided I would read Bruce Trigger's Understanding Early Civilizations. And this is what I did on my balcony in the summer. And I worked through this. And part of this was kind of leaving behind a lot of the, all of the hurdles I had to jump over, all the hoops I had to go through to get to the point where I could work on my research as a PhD student. And so his advice was invaluable because I went back to the burning questions that I had, the things that I couldn't help myself um, but be inspired by, be interested in. Um, so this is what I did. So yours might not be a humongous book um, about early civilizations, um, but something, right? Find the thing that brings you back to why you're doing this in the first place. Um, and it was really, really good advice. And it did get me back on track and, and re-inspired. Um, the next piece of, or next item, we're getting close to the end, don't worry, um, is a letter. And it's a letter that was um, written um, as an assessment of my research. And it was written by one of the people I most respect in my field, um, where she praised my work. Right? This was somebody whose work I really admired, and here she had wonderful things to say about my work, and insightful things, not just like, this is great, but insightful things to say about my work. And this reminds me to think about whose opinion I value. Right? Because there's going to be all kinds of people in the world, not everybody's going to like you. Right? That's actually a really good piece of advice someone gave me when I got my first set of teaching evaluations back. You know, you're going to have 60 people in a room and somebody's going to hate you. Right? That's actually pretty good <laughs> statistics, really. Yeah. Yeah, if it's just one, you're, you're doing pretty well, right? And it's always the one you fixate on too, right? Um, but it's that same sort of thing. Decide whose opinion matters to you, right? And that helps you decide about how you're going to take feedback, how you're going to take criticism, right? And, and from who and from how. Um, it also, you know, there are people, again, you know, who will, especially in the academic world, try to cherry pick your failings and try to write your story out of that, right? Don't do their work for them, ever, right? Try to think about the people whose opinion matters to you, the people who you respect, who do work that you respect, and think about their opinions, right? And why their opinions matter to you. And if they give you feedback, it's even more, even more powerful. Um, this also helps you um, figure out when, when you need to object, because sometimes we fail and it's totally on us. Other times we fail because we've hit a brick wall for whatever reason. Uh, so this can help you sort out you know, when you have to self-advocate, right? or when you have to just burn it all down. So think about that. Think about whose opinion matters, and matters to you, and why. Um, the next bit, it's another thing from my bulletin board, and it's actually a, a card that a colleague gave me. And this, again, speaks to you know, whose opinion matters. Um, and it says, whichever way you throw me, I stand. Right? And that's a good reminder to me that, um, well, success and failure are nouns. They're not adjectives. Right? They're not things that describe you. Right? And this has been something hard for me to remember in my Lisa Simpson days, uh, that you know, I, I should not define myself by my success, but by how I deal with the things that come along, how I deal with my success, how I deal with my failure. And I'd much rather be known as this sort of person, that whichever way you throw me, I stand, right? That actually makes me feel much more powerful than to say that I am successful. Right? And I have never failed or something like that. So I really do like this little bit. Okay, uh, the final item is my whole pile of things. Um, and this is just the advice to remember to treat people, other people better when they fail, right? Especially if you've been through it yourself, right? Remember, you get to decide when you're on the other side, and you will be. You'll, in some point, you'll be in a position to make judgments upon other people, um, to offer feedback, right? And you get a choice at that time, right? What kind of person do you want to be in that moment? Right? Do you want to be the grouchy feedback reviewer? Right? Do, you want to, do you want to focus on other people's failures alone, or do you want to see how they've grown? Right? So that's the point when you get to decide um, in that moment you know, how, you want, how you want to treat other people in their moments um, when they are perhaps not as happy with what they have or, or have not achieved. So uh, that is why I decided to do this.
right? That this is, this is a moment where I can give some of that back. Thanks. Mm-hmm.